There are two very important hormones that govern or control the reabsorptive capabilities of the renal tubules as well as the collecting ducts. And these two are called atrial natriuretic peptide and atrial natri natriuretic peptide, sometimes abbreviated as ANP, reduces uh, blood sodium, therefore reducing blood volume and blood pressure since they're both related. And this particular peptide is released by cardiac atrial cells, as kind of makes sense by the name. And the other one is parathyroid hormone, and it acts on the distal convoluted tubule to increase calcium reabsorption. So um, one of the other most important hormones to regulating the concentration of urine is called ADH. And ADH uh, increases the permeability of the collecting ducts, sometimes using uh, the formation of what are called aquaporins. So therefore, low ADH makes the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct less permeable to water, leading to more concentrated urine, whereas um, dilute urine would be due to the impermeability of distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct to water, allowing for more water to be secreted into the renal tubule, leading to the collecting duct and thus form the formation of the urine. So our next couple slides do a really great job of summarizing what goes on in the various regions of the renal tubule. So let's take a look a little more closely at each of these areas. And we're first gonna look at the proximal convoluted tubule. And the important thing to know first of all is that about 80% of all sodium ions are reabsorbed in the PCT. Virtually all nutrients, so glucose, amino acids, vitamins, and some ions are reabsorbed there, as well as various other ions that you see listed here, some bicarbonate, water, lipid-soluble solutes, as well as urea. And the mechanism for this for sodium is called secondary active transport, so it relies on the ATP that's uh, broken down from, for example, sodium potassium pump. So again, the bottom line is that the most reabsorption happens in the PCT. Now looking at the nephron loop, also called the loop of Henle, during the descending limb, this is where water is reabsorbed. So if water is reabsorbed, that means that as the fluid travels to the basis the hairpin turn, if you will, of the nephron loop, that means that the fluid becomes more and more concentrated. Then in the ascending limb, this is going to be impermeable to water. And for that very reason, the water returns to the same concentration that it was, basically in the proximal convoluted tubule, as well as the distal convoluted tubule. And then final modifications are made in the collecting duct, specifically with the use of ADH. So on our next slide, we look at the distal convoluted tubule. And the big part that happens here is going to be that there is also reabsorption of salt, NaCl, plus calcium. And this is utilizing the hormone PTH that we just saw a, a couple slides ago. And then finally, the collecting duct is the final modification of what's going to lead to the urine. And this is where ADH primarily is going to play a role and aldosterone. Remember that aldosterone is responsible for reabsorbing sodium. So the sodium returns into the blood, thus increasing the blood pressure. So the summary of these events is shown on our next slide. This graphic does a really nice 
job of showing what happens in the general regions. So during the, in the proximal convoluted tubule, notice that 65% of filtrate volume is reabsorbed. So remember the filtrate is everything that's formed through glomerular filtration. It's the forced movement of liquids across the glomerular membrane. And notice that all nutrients are reabsorbed here. Water is reabsorbed in the descending limb of the loop of Henle. So it's highly concentrated at the hairpin turn of the nephron loop. So the ascending limb is impermeable to water. And so only ions like sodium, potassium, and chloride are reabsorbed. Then in the distal convoluted tubule, this is uh, controlled primarily by hormones, aldosterone and parathyroid hormone. And it's regulated um, by aldosterone, depending on the needs of the body, depending on what the blood pressure is. And then the final modification is in the collecting duct, primarily by ADH. And the final um, function, one of the final functions of the urinary system is the regulation of pH balance in the blood. And that's gonna be covered in future lectures, fluids, electrolytes, and acid-base balance. So the regulation of urine concentration and volume, it is defined by um, something that's called the milliosmoles. And the unit milliosmoles has to do with the solute concentration. So it's defined as the number of solute particles in one kilogram of water. So it's kind of like osmolarity but osmolarity is concerned with specific ions, whereas this is the total number of solute particles. It doesn't matter whether it's sodium, whether it's potassium, chloride, and so on. So this osmolality now needs to uh, stay around 300 milliosmoles, and there's a couple ways that this occurs. It's using what's called the countercurrent mechanism, which has two parts to it. One part is called the countercurrent multiplier, and this is the interaction of the filtrate, which remember the filtrate is the term for the liquid that's in the renal tubule. It's the flow of that filtrate in the ascending and the descending limbs of juxtamedullary nephrons. And those are the nephrons that have a much longer nephron loop as well as the countercurrent exchanger. And this is the blood flow that is in the vasa recta. And the vasa recta is the specialized capillary bed that's surrounding a juxtamedullary nephron. So the, um, this concentration, it, run, it changes from about 300 milliosmoles in the cortex to 1,200 milliosmoles at the bottom of the medulla, at that hairpin turn that I had mentioned. So the countercurrent multiplier, it creates this gradient, and the exchanger is going to preserve that gradient. So what's important to remember is that in the PCT and the DCT, the concentration, the osmolality is 300 milliosmoles. However, in the Medulla in the deeper part of the um, nephron loop at that hairpin turn, the concentration is 1200 milliosmoles. So we can see that shown really well on this diagram. You can see in the cortex area, there's an osmolality of 300 milliosmoles. And you can see close to the um, the very bottom of the renal pyramid, right at the minor calyx, close to the entrance of the minor calyx, where we find the uh, hairpin turn of the nephron loop, that's where it progressively increases to 1200 milliosmoles. But then again, remember, as that filtrate travels upwards towards the DCT, it starts to get diluted 
in that it returns back to the 300 milliosmoles. So your take home point here is that the concentration, the osmolality that's found in the PCT as well as the DCT is 300 milliosmoles. So the ju juxta uh, glomerular, I'm sorry, juxtamedullary nephrons play a very important role in creating this osmotic gradient. And these are specialized nephrons that are located in organisms that have to survive in a dry, um, kind of arid environment where they don't have the ability to just pick up a water bottle. So, um, in our kidneys, we have about 20% or so of these juxtamedullary nephrons because we have the ability to pick up a bottle of Zephyr Hills water, or Aquafina water, or drink water as much as we need to. But um, camels would be a really good example of having nephrons that have more of these juxtamedullary nephrons and less of the other type, which are the cortical nephrons. So the long nephron loops create this gradient and that acts as the countercurrent multipliers. And then the vasorecta is the countercurrent exchanger. So the countercurrent, the vasorecta is just a specialized capillary network instead of the paratubular capillaries. But it, it, perform, it performs the same function, but instead of it being surrounding the PCT and the DCT, it's surrounding these juxtamedullary nephrons, the nephron loop specifically. And then the collecting ducts of the all nephrons, they're going to use this gradient to adjust the urine osmolality accordingly, primarily with the use of ADH to either form concentrated urine or very dilute urine. So the countercurrent multiplier, the more of the salt in the ascending limb is going to actively transport out into the interstitial fluid and more water diffuses out of the descending limb. But the difference is it's multiplied along the length of the loop. That's why it's called the countercurrent multiplier. So from 300 to 1200 milliosmoles. Whereas the exchanger has to do with the vasa recta, which we can see shown in this diagram here. So if we zoom in just a little more closely, uh, I believe this is also a focus figure in your textbook we can see that the long nephron loops are shown here and the filtrate flows in opposite directions. So it's kind of like two rivers flowing in opposite directions, two currents. Remember in the descending limb, water is reabsorbed, but in the ascending limb, the cells are impermeable to water. So only salt is removed. So the concentration goes from 300 to 1200 in the descending limb, and then the opposite happens in the ascending limb. So there's this, this kind of uh, feedback cycle that's going to occur of water leaving the descending limb that increases the osmolality of the filtrate. And as it does so, the increased osmolality of the filtrate entering the ascending limb causes the need for salt to be removed so that the um, concentration of the filtrate can be returned to normal. And that's the countercurrent mechanism.